Great. Um, I think we should start now. So, well, thank you very much for joining my talk. Um, my name is Aditya. You can call me Adi. And I'm very happy to talk to you about my project. My project is called Power Measurement and Attribution for Processes and Hardware Devices in the Linux Kernel. Before we start, I'll just quickly give a brief introduction. I am a graduate student at ETH Zurich in Switzerland. Um, it's, a, it's a university, and I do research at the intersection of computer architecture, operating systems, and computer networks. I really like this very much, so let's quickly start with a bit of tiny, like very brief background so that all of us are on the same page. <coughs> now, what do we mean by energy sources in computing systems, right? All of us have computing systems in our pockets and in our bags and in front of us. How do we power them? We power them with energy. And what are the sources of this energy? Well, one source is a direct input, which can be via DC, USB, even Ethernet. You can power these devices via battery, for example, a cell phone. Or you can even have very interesting devices like energy harvesting devices. They're becoming more popular now. Now, what we want to do is we want to use the maximum, no, I'm sorry, we want to use the minimum amount of energy to perform the tasks that we are trying to do, okay? Why do we want to use the minimum amount of energy? Like, why is that word maximum struck out? Because energy capacity, or also known as battery capacity, is a major design constraint for any consumer device. For example, cell phones, um, AR, VR headsets, they're all fundamentally constrained by the amount of energy that you can put into the device. All of us want a cell phone with infinite battery power that you never have to charge, right? But that does not exist because of physical limitations. So we have to minimize a resource which is fundamentally finite. Okay, so with that, with, that, with that done, let's try to go into the problem. Now, let me start, let me start by asking you a question. How do you optimize latency? All of us are, we have a software engineering background and we're familiar with latency or performance optimization. Um, you would say, okay, I would measure my program's latency using well-established tools, for example, perf or the time command and using a well-known metric, for example, seconds, milliseconds, even CPU clock cycles. I can do this easily and I know exactly what to do. Let's make it a bit harder. What if I ask you to Tell me how much energy your application is using. Can you point me to a tool right now off the top of your head? Like you said, perf. Can you point me to a tool which tells you how much energy your application is using right away? That's a great answer. Thank you for this answer. I love this answer. We're gonna cover that shortly. But yes, thank you for this answer. Okay, so um, here's a very, like, how did I get to this question? So this question is what defines this talk. And by the end of this talk, I want you to be slightly closer to answering this question. My goal from this talk is that you should have a better idea of if someone asks you tomorrow in, this, in, 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 in a reasonable setting, what could be the answer here? You should have a better answer than power top. <laughs> okay, so um, how did I get to this? Well, long time ago in a far, far away land, I was an undergraduate engineering student. And I had an exam the next day and I was sitting in the library and I'm trying to study for my exam, right? Because I want to pass. And I see that, okay, my laptop just keeps dying every hour. So as a classic engineering undergrad, I'm like, hmm, if my laptop is dying, I'm gonna shut off the applications that are killing my battery. Like very, very like rational engineering undergraduate mindset. Kill the applications which are consuming your battery. And then I set out to do this and I could not find the applications. My Linux system will not tell me which applications are killing my battery. And that brings us to this question. That's why we're standing here today. How can I find this out? So let's continue with the story. Let's continue with our, our undergrad. The undergrad says, okay, um, I studied this formula. This is like energy consumption, say it is uh, given by power times latency. Now I can obtain power from the CPU. We have this very interesting interface known as RAPL which tells me how much power the CPU is using. Let's say the CPU reports I'm consuming 15 watts. Great. And our undergrad also now tries to get the latency. He uses this well-established tool, time, perf, or the tool of your choice, and says, okay, a particular application takes five milliseconds to run. Voila. Energy consumption equals power times latency. 
Seven family joules. Is that the answer? Well, it turns out this does not reflect the ground truth. This is as far away from the ground truth as we can be. Why is that? Let's try to dig deeper what just happened. Well, this model, what we just saw right now, assumes a linear power draw, okay? It assumes that the CPU power is flat over time, over the entire five milliseconds. That is simply not the case because this is how an actual power draw looks like. You can see a typical power draw in which the CPU switches states very quickly over time. We can see a lot of valleys and peaks in this graph, and if you happen to measure your power at a, at a valley, you would not even see the bulk of the power consumption. You would work with a value that is completely incorrect. So the first limitation is that power is not constant over time, right? We need to move out of this mindset. Second, our calculation model focuses on the CPU. Remember the REPL interface? I got the value of power 15 watts from REPL. Now, we did not think about other devices in the system. We have devices like DRAM. We have the screen backlight. You have the network card, which is also drawing power because they're, they're not free, right? These are not, these are not magical devices. So we, we, we have experimental data which demonstrates that very often these devices can dominate your overall power consumption, especially if you have a GPU workload, which can easily eclipse your entire CPU's TDP. And our experimental analysis is also corroborated by research published in other venues. So this is the second limitation. We do not think about other devices because we find it very difficult. Third, once again, let's take a look at REPL. So REPL is available only on specific classes of processors, okay? Specific families support REPL interface. Intel or AMD support REPL, but ARM has a completely different interface and even completely different metrics and even completely different reporting mechanism. So, the limitation is that we do not have a uniform interface or a reliable data format to get the data that I'm looking for across different devices, across different platforms. Now, I would like to bring all these three problems together and summarize them in this statement. We are inaccurately calculating only a fraction of a specific system's actual energy consumption. We are not even looking at the entire picture. And that was a summary, but you might forget this, right? This is a complex statement. One thing I would love for you to take away, and this is a statement that I really like, we cannot improve what we cannot measure. So what I'm trying to give you is that we must learn to measure energy correct first, and then we can improve it. And we must improve it because it is determining how we can de design devices of the future. Okay, so what is the goal of my project? What am I trying to accomplish here? My goal is to develop a framework, develop a useful framework to accurately and reliably measure the energy consumption of a process on Linux. All right, well, let's say, let's say I get this data. What is the impact of this? What is going to be the use of this data? First of all, we want to report these statistics to the end user. Remember our young little undergrad who was just trying to study for his exam? He needs to be able to kill the applications that are killing his battery, okay? So an easy to understand and a useful format which allows our undergrad to pass. By the way, which he did, like he passed the exam, okay? So, <laughs> right. A second key stakeholder for the system would be the programmers. We want to report via useful APIs data that improves programmer actionability. Actionability is a fancy word. We'll get back to this, what I mean by actionability. But essentially, I want programmers to be able to take action on their code using this data. Okay, so let's try to drill down what we're trying to do here. I said I want to develop a framework. What does a framework mean? A framework means models and tools. A power model is essentially how we reason about a device, okay? So we went through that example of a CPU's power consumption. We had this mental model in mind that a CPU is drawing constant power over time. So all of us have these models of different things. That's how we work, right? That's how we fundamentally we view reality. Power models are often not available or very poorly understood for devices which dominate the power landscape. For example, DRAM power models are um, they're, they're quite tricky. They're often not even available. People don't even reason about them. Second would be the tools. Once you understand how a device works with power, then you can build a tool 
to use this understanding to get to a value. One such tool would be the NVIDIA SMI utility. NVIDIA has provided us a tool which knows how the GPU is working, and then it's able to give us the value that we're looking for. We don't need the model in this case because NVIDIA has built the model for us, and it's the proprietary information. So, in summary, we need accurate models, and we need reliable tools to calculate energy consumption. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Now we come back to a great answer from before, part up. Well, if energy consumption is such an old and useful problem, why has no one solved this before? Why have people not done it before? Well, it turns out that people have looked at energy consumption before. PowerTop is a tool from Intel which tries to give you the power estimate of a particular process, device, timer, or interrupt. On the screen right now, you see a screenshot from a runtime instance of PowerTop. The leftmost column shows you the power estimate value, and the rightmost column shows you the description or the particular entity to which that value is assigned. Here, in this case, we can see that the GNOME shell is consuming 1.45 watts. Hmm, just keep this in mind, what does this mean? GNOME shell and 1.45 watts. Assume, in this case, that GNOME shell is a single process. Okay, it represents an application for, for, this, for the purpose of this discussion. So, it is possible to view the power estimate of a device or a process or an interrupter or timer using PowerTop. Great, but what did we miss here? What did we skim over here? Well, it turns out that power estimate is a discrete time event. What do I mean by discrete time event? If you have a graph, power is one point on that graph. Energy consumption is the area under the graph. And it turns out that energy consumption has a higher correlation with your battery drain as compared to power. Second, PowerTop comes from Intel, so it has um, a lot of vendor-specific uh, implementation details, which make it difficult to scale and extend towards generalizability. And third, we come back to this magical word that we skipped before, actionability. What is the actionability of power data? And here comes a very, very important question that I, I really want you to think about. Remember we saw GNOME shell takes 1.45 watts? Right? If a particular process takes 1.45 watts, what does that tell you to do next? Does this give you anything to work with? What is, what should the programmer do to reduce it? We don't know. We don't know where it's going. We don't know where it's coming from. We just see a number and we don't know how to use it. We don't know how to take action with this number. And that is something that I want to fix. So, all said and done, we understand our problem, measuring energy consumption. We understand our goal, doing this in a correct and reliable way. And we understand why current tools are lacking. Let's try to go through the system design that I built. On the screen right now, you see a flowchart, a very simplified flowchart of how the system operates. Fundamentally, this is a regression system, regression model. And every regression model has two inputs. You have the parameters, and you have the input variables, or x. At the end of the day, we need to determine both of these inputs in order to get an output, which would be the predicted value. Let's try to work through how the system works. We'll first focus on the parameters. In this case, the parameters here are de uh, derived from device-specific measurements. The inputs are derived from process accounting infrastructure that is in slash proc slash that interface. And then it is all input to the model to predict a value. The first step, the parameters. How do we get the parameters? Well, we have a, a complete algorithm for this. The first step in this process is to get the baseline load of the system. So what we do is we turn off everything keep the system at minimal load, and take a lot of measurements. Understand what is the baseline power draw, okay? Once we have a reliable value for that, we start to add things one by one. So let's say that your system is running at 10 watts at baseline, and now you turn on Netflix, and now it says, oh, I'm using 14 watts. Would you say Netflix uses four watts? No, because 
Well, this is not going to be a good way to do things because Netflix is going to use your network, is going to use your screen, is going to use your speakers, maybe Bluetooth, um, is also going to use your uh, memory, right? And of course, it's going to use your CPU because the CPU has to periodically wake up to service the network interrupts. The packet has arrived, service the packet, send the data to the screen. So what we want to do is we want to really isolate every component. We really need to split this apart to make sense of the system. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we turn on a single target device. Let's take the example of the screen. At the baseline, I turn on just the screen and I set it at the minimum backlight level. I once again obtain multiple readings. After that, I sweep the screen because I do understand that the screen has a backlight which will consume more power as I increase the backlight, right? So we sweep the target device across its operating range to understand how far it can go. What is the minimum and what is the maximum? Once we have the minimum and maximum for one particular device, we turn that device off. So we completely isolate it. And then we once again revert to the baseline. And you repeat this step for all the devices that are available in your system. This allows you to individually measure the contribution of a particular device. Well, let's say reasonably measure. Okay, so what we just did right now is we did some experiments which covered my top left box and which gave me some parameters which can fill in my bottom left box. Let's move to the next blue box that would be process accounting infrastructure. So we have the regression parameters. Now we need the input variables. How do we determine the inputs? And this is where attribution comes in. This is where I isolate the contribution of one process to the energy consumption of my system. The Linux kernel tracks how much resource is allocated to each process. It continuously tracks it and reports it via the PROC interface. So what we do is we simply use that interface. First of all, we determine the PID and the process groups for our target. Using this information, we go into the PROC interface and pull out the data that we need. And that, that data would be the jiffies, the memory set size, the file handles, the network sockets, the screen backups. Screen backups is especially tricky. And uh, yeah, for, for now we're looking at this data and this is also overwhelming, but I believe this is not comprehensive. We really want to push this even further, right? For example, um, the USB polls every five milliseconds. And whenever the device is connected, there's a surge on the circuit. And that is something that I cannot account for right now, but I would love to. Okay, so once we have this data for each process, what we also do is we calculate the fraction or the percentage that this process was used. So let's say that I, I was running this, this, this experiment over 10 seconds. And over the 10 seconds, my process was actually in flight only for 1.5 seconds. So that means that the total energy value that I'll see over 10 seconds, at max, only 15% of that can be attributed back to my process. So we have to be very careful about, uh, let's say, being a bit more precise than what we have so far. And once we have this fraction, we have our input parameters. And these input parameters can go inside the regression model. Okay, so we covered the blue boxes, the left two blue boxes give you the parameters, the top central blue box gives you the inputs, and you have the inputs and the parameters which can go into regression and get you a prediction. Great, life is great, you know, we solved the problem, let's go home. No, it's, it's, it's not that simple. So I just described to you a system, and I must also describe to you the drawbacks of the system that I see. Things that I want to work on, things that I want feedback on, things that I would appreciate your inputs on. First of all, at the end of the day, we have an estimated value, okay? This is an estimated energy value. Um, there's a very famous line in machine learning community, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And my goal is to make a useful model here. I understand it is not correct. It's not wrong, it's not correct but it should be useful. And second, 
accuracy and bias trade-off. So a very nice way to explain this would be what we're doing is you have a system that is running your, your, your application. And now I am running another thing at the same time along with my application. So this, this, this new utility that is running is also going to create some stress. It's going to create a load on the system itself, right? The bigger the utility, the more it will bias my readings. So if you want to be really accurate with your values, you have to use a bigger model. And if you use a bigger model, that's going to perform more computations because more parameters, more multiplications, more computations, and that's going to stress or bias the values that you observe for your application itself, okay? So accurate models generate a larger load. And we want to minimize, so this is a trade-off, there's a Pareto curve, and on this Pareto curve, you have accuracy on the y-axis and load on the x-axis, and we need to find a sweet spot on this Pareto curve where we have reasonable accuracy and minimal load. There's no point in having an extremely accurate model which takes forever to run. And there's no point in having a model that says every process is using zero watts because it can't distinguish. It simply does not have the expressive, expressiveness. So there's a sweet spot in there somewhere that, that, that needs to be determined very carefully. And this is hard. Okay, second problem, data collection. The Linux ecosystem is fragmented as compared to other ecosystems, for example, Windows, Macintosh. There are millions of devices ranging from embedded systems running on a few mi uh, milliwatts to data center class servers which pull in a thousand watts every second. And we have billions of ICs inside the, the, these, uh, these systems, right? And these ICs are at a huge scale. So we have a system which needs to operate reliably and precisely across three orders of magnitude. The milliwatts of embedded systems and the kilowatts of data center class systems. How do we develop like accurate and reliable power models across this diversity, across this range? Because what is normal for a kilowatt system is going to completely obliterate a milliwatt reading. That, that scale needs to be very carefully tuned. Third, validation of ground truth. So for our experiments, once we got the predicted value, we validated that value with hardware measurements. What we did was we took a multimeter and we probed into the wire and then we did the same experiment again. And that gives you like actual hardware reading of the system. That is one reasonable way to validate your data. Um, we call this the ground truth, but we cannot do this always. If, if, this, if this model is to be deployed on a larger scale, I simply cannot go to every device in this world and probe it manually. Like, <laughs> that's, not, that's not going to be possible. So we want to have clever ways to identify regressions from the ground truth without having the support of the hardware measurements. I'm working, I'm, I'm, I have some interesting ideas on this. Please come talk to me afterwards if you would love to discuss more. Okay, privacy, this is a tricky one. We need data. Everyone wants data, data is a new goal. You hear all this every day. We want data, but should users share this data? Like, I can identify what you're doing simply by looking at your energy data. There are a lot of research papers which do fingerprinting based on your energy values, right? Are you willing to share this data? And if you are willing to share it, who is going to host it? Who is going to manage it? And who is going to have control over it? <laughs> Ideas are very welcome. Okay, um, so some of the challenges that I see. Finally, a tiny bit of cherry on top. Carbon emissions, something that we don't off hear very often. How do we calculate the carbon emission of software? Some of us took flights to come here, right? That's a huge amount of carbon emission. But I would say that the amount of carbon that you have spent on the software that you use every day is comparable. 
But how do we make this comparable? How do we see this? How do we bring that data into light? Well, we just saw how we can calculate energy consumption. It turns out that we can slightly extend that, extend that operation to get the carbon footprint by multiplying it with the energy composition. Composition essentially means, and we'll, we'll see like up next what, what's comp what composition means, but what we're trying to understand is where is the energy coming from that you're using to power this device right now? So like what is, what is the source of this power that is going inside my laptop right now? So we, we saw this very nice formula, energy is power times latency. Energy composition depends on the factors, right? Where you're located. For example, if you're located in um, Norway or Denmark, you are quite likely using very green energy. Whereas if you're located um, in a middle to low income country, you might be consuming energy that comes from a coal fired plant, which is very environment, which, which emits a huge amount of carbon, right? So it depends on the geography. It even depends on the time of availability. For example, if you're running your system in the daytime, you might be using solar energy. Whereas at nighttime, it is likely coming from a power plant. And the cost. Fortunately, we don't need to worry about this problem. There are a lot of people who are working on identifying energy composition of a particular place, time, and location. There are libraries out there which can give you this information, so I choose to not focus on this part of the problem. I choose to constrain myself on the consumption, calculation of the consumption part of the problem. So, all said and done, we went through this nice journey. Where's the, where's the treat? Where's the, show me the goods. This is the goods. So, I envision, again, this is not finished, but I envision a nice end user utility which tells people how much energy went to a particular hardware device or a particular application. And for the programmers, what we want to do is we want to expose an API. We want to expose an, an interface which allows programmers to, programmers to get this data for a process for their program and also to backtrace it to the code. That is much harder. To backtrace the value to a particular code line is a much harder problem. I would love to discuss, I have some ideas. It's a bit more advanced systems engineering, virtual machines and stuff, but I would love to discuss. A use case for this would be, imagine that you're programming your next big application and you just wrote a for, for loop inside a for loop and it tells you, uh-uh-uh, that's gonna kill your system. Do not use nested for loops here, use something else. So energy efficient code optimizations in the platform itself. That is, that is a goal that we want to, uh, that is a goal that I would love to see. Okay, so all said and done, I'm very, I'm very glad to have you here. And I understand we take away some things and we don't take away some things. If you forget everything that, that I just talked about, please, please, please remember these two things. Okay, I'm going to put these two things here right now that I would love for you to take away. First of all, a line that I, believe in and I hold very dear to my heart. We cannot improve what we cannot measure. We must first learn to measure something correctly to improve it, okay? And this applies for everything, not just energy. And second, we need to break out of this mindset of a CPU-centric world. Non-CPU system components can dominate your overall energy consumption. Do not quote me on this, but as an example, I have seen some references which state that DRAM is now the dominant energy consumer in data centers. Again, I'm, I'm not a data center provider or operator. Do not quote me on this. Okay, so thank you very much. I really appreciated your attention and your audience. I would love to get feedback or follow up with you and open the floor for Q&A. Yes? So how does this relate to projects like uh, AMD and I think Intel also has it, like key state records? Testing. So how does this relate to things like uh, um, AMD P straight drivers and you, uh, yeah, I'm gonna start off with that. Yeah, I have two questions. So how does this relate to uh, 
like scheduling and P state algorithms? How do you see this being incorporated in that? Okay, so just to repeat the question for the audience, if I understand it correctly, how does this mechanism relate to P state drivers, which is a feature for AMD processors? <laughs> so P state refers to the package state, which refers to the overall power state for a particular CPU that it uses, it, it, it picks based on the frequency and voltage. It, it's a part of the DVFS tuning. I would argue that my system focuses on the software level. P state is independent and is running at the CPU level. All I need is for AMD to reliably tell me at a high enough frequency. So the, all I need is the processor to tell me the exact power value for that, for that state, for that P state. Now, the problem here is that P states and C states switch much faster than the processor reports this data. RAPL works at a frequency of, I believe, one millisecond. You get one reading every one, one millisecond, if I'm not wrong, it might be wrong. Whereas P states and C states are, I think they switch at microsecond level or maybe even, even faster. So you can see, right, you can go from a C0 to a C7 a thousand times before your value is actually updated. And for multiple processors. For multiple processor. Right. Yeah. Which is not what you want. Yes, yes. So it's a great, it's a great optimization. We need it. We need good scheduling tools for P states and C states. But what I would love to also see is to connect it with the software, to trust the software to give it the accurate value at a high enough frequency. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Okay, so great presentation. I help on the development of PowerTop. So um, thank you. So we need to evolve PowerTop. It hasn't been touched in a while and needs to evolve for for the sanity and because of we have a real problem. Um, there are some cool ideas that we also need to share. For example, now we have um, profiling. We have way to access to the profiler. We have way to access to what kind of instructions are being executed dynamically on, let's think not on IO, on, on embedded, but on servers. So for example, there are new tools, uh, process watch tells you what a specific instruction are being executed on the process and that a specific time. So if you model the instructions from the power consumption of some of specific instruction, you have a database somewhere and you know what instruction are being executed the model fits, right? You can yes. estimate from that perspective from the instruction approach. Now you said, okay, non-CPU system, that I agree, but the number of calls that you do yes. to the memory yeah. will probably give you an estimation. And the part that yes. you said about the for loops, it's with the compilers. Yes. So yes. we need to work with the compiler team yes. to say, hey, how can, for example, those two loops that you mentioned, yes. There is a flag um, F loop interchange. Yeah. That if you enable in the compiler, they will yes. tell you, hold on. Yes. They will not even tell you. Yes. They will switch the, 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 the big loop with the small loop yes. just to save use of memory. Yes. Forgetting about power. Now, yes. we must think about a way that they tell the compiler yes. what metrics. And the last one, C dyne. If we can measure C dyne dynamically, somehow, I don't know where, we could estimate better that approach the capacitance of the application of that perspective on the specific CPU that we're using. But yeah, yeah. there is yeah. a lot of work to do there. Yes. Congrats. These, these are great points. Thank you for sharing them. I really love this point about instruction, specific instruction. That immediately brings to my mind AVX because AVX is going to see the spike in the CPU, right? Actually, it's much more targeted just for AVX and Vectorize instruction. <laughs> okay, so, okay, well, then we're on the same page. That's fantastic. Yes. That's fantastic. But those are great points. Thank you so much. I really appreciate them. Um, more questions, please. I'm going to run away, you know, like this is the time. How do you measure the memory? Yes, so use... that's, a, that's a great point. So I did a bit of research into memory microarchitecture. Yes. 
and I assume that all the accesses are served from one gang, okay? You have multiple gangs, you have banks, subarrays, everything. We assume that one process, like one page maps to one gang. And what we did was fundamentally, first of all, determine the number of gangs in the particular ship. So we don't even go to channels, right? Channels are going to mess, mess up things crazy. I, first of all, like I reduce everything to number of gangs, and then I figure out how many gangs are being run and what is the resident memory set size? And the resident set size and the number of gangs and the total DRAM consumption. These three data points can break down to give you the memory value. We need to switch in that. That's a good idea. Try to switch to proportional set size. Yes. Because resident set size will not take into consideration the use of that process with the use yes, of the yes, rest yes. of the libraries that are being yes. shared for the other pr process. I know, and I know, yes. So yeah. we have a, an open source tool called PSS Stop okay. that we develop in collaboration with Arjun Mandevan, yes. who is the owner yes. of PowerTop, yeah. to measure that part of the memory. Fantastic. So it's open source, it's provided by Intel, all of those. So yes. yeah, we need to talk about that. Okay. That would be fantastic. This is great. Thank you so much. Memory is very tricky. Wait. Yes. <laughs> Running away in five, four, three, two. Come on, guys. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your audience. Thank you for listening to me. And yeah, I hope you have a great day.